look at that. I think we're good to go. And we've got ultra low latency going. Um, I think stuff is good. We've got a real con experience happening today. Oh, I should. Oh, one, one moment. Hold on. There we are. That's a little more, a uh, little brighter. Welcome back, everyone, to OnCon. Uh, that's right, we are doing our online anime convention today. It is Saturday morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Time. Um, I've changed the chat, so, so it now should be nice, low latency, fast. People should be able to just uh, jump on in there. And uh, unfortunately, the first few comments um, uh, uh, never quite show up, but I see folks are starting to filter in to the chat room. Good morning, everyone. Good to be, ooh. <laughs> That's right, my computer's letting me know that it's Saturday morning. Um, I normally have uh, reminders come in to say, uh, for myself, to remind myself to you do uh, the, the Saturday cleanup routine, you know, around the house. But this is a special Saturday morning where I will not be um, dusting and vacuuming anytime soon. Hey, JJ. So um, uh, we'll see. Maybe during one of the panels, you'll uh, you'll see me in the background dusting and vacuuming um, while other folks are doing panels. We'll we'll see. But yes, it is time for um, uh, to get back into everything. Hope you all had a good evening, good night. Friday went well. Had a good time hanging out and chatting. I'm um, sorry I wasn't able to get the D and D going for myself. I was just not ready for all that, but. Um, um, I think D&D &D might be something we should schedule. We should, like, um, I should, like, have a, a set, like, D&D &D game or Whispering Road or Ryutama game or something and kind of do that separately from the whole con thing. I think it makes a, a little more sense. Um, I had a good time watching some of the anime over on the SciTube because um, we had stuff, uh, some stuff over there. I wonder if I could show... Um, see here there's a uh, thing there Visual text that might make some sense um, let me see if I can throw the side tube URL well, I don't want to do that because then uh, I was thinking of putting the side tube URL in the, in, the, in the bottom but then on the recorded video everyone will see the side tube link and it won't necessarily be up that doesn't really make sense um, I'd like to sit in on a live stream of a D&D game that's a that's a cool idea um, yeah, I, I like that idea where it's, we're playing, but we're also live streaming so folks can kind of see how things go. That's cool. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see that. So I had a good time, um, this morning watching some of the Saturday morning cartoons, all, uh, kids anime of the 80s. Watch some of, uh, Beast King Go Lion, which is the anime that, uh, Voltron was based on, at least the Lion Voltron was based on and uh um oh cool charmy you're you're fully invested in interviewing gables as well you should be that is a um, that is an amazing anime series a lot of effort put into that um really really cool stuff i just want to double check something on the chat um make sure that's good yep we're just uh huh i gotta play around with the chat a little bit um the first, like, 10 or 12 chat messages just don't show up because of how it's um, displaying things and cropping things off. So, um, but yeah, Anime Green Gables is wonderful. So, yeah, Be Single Lion, um, I had forgotten how cheesy the opening theme song to that is. It's a very 70s disco opening. Glad they changed that for the American version, to be honest. Um, and much more violent than the American version. Um, although I think the American version like toned down the violence in appropriate ways where it's it, it's not like violence has disappeared it's just that it's not as on screen in your face as it is in the original so um, yes the delay issue seems to be um, or at least I, I decreased the delay to the minimum possible value so I think the delay is, is the chat delay is is handled um, keep your fingers crossed uh, we'll see how that goes Mm. But yeah, Be Single Lion was fun. 
Uh, we watched some of a Plares Sanchiro, uh, an anime from the 80s about uh, kids with plastic models fighting each other. Um, or fight, they're, they're plastic models fighting each other. So like the Gundam Build Fighters, Gundam Build Divers franchise, but uh, in the 80s, uh, independent thing. Uh, and then some of the Swiss Family Robinson anime, um, Flo which I think is the, the full title is something like Flore, Swiss Family Robinson and the Mysterious Island, one of these incredibly long titles. But uh, yeah, it was, um, um, Flore uh, is a, uh, it's a cute show, um, reworked so that the, uh, uh, the Robinsons now have a little girl. Um, and so instead of having a 15-year-old like and 10-year-old boy, it's a 15-year-old boy, 10-year-old girl, 3-year-old boy. Um, and that was, uh, that was lovely. Uh, the first episode is just them in their normal environment and getting the letter telling them they may have to leave and all the drama that, that thus ensues. So it seems like a pretty slow burn for an anime series, um, but uh, but fun. They did a good job of establishing a little girl, Flore, and apparently it is on Amazon Prime Video, dubbed. You can just watch a dub of that on Amazon Prime Video. Like They dubbed that in the 80s and brought it over to America. What's the first anime to adapt a classic English novel? That's a great question. Um, that's, gosh, not much, or that, that's, um, um, was it Heidi in 74, whatever that was, um, I'm not sure, um, that'd be a good thing too, to dig. Um, JJ asked, the Gege no Kitaro you showed was the original broadcast. Have you seen the updated one running currently? Yeah, the first couple episodes of the, of the new one, and I'm really impressed. Um, I'm a fan of Kitaro. Um, I have some of the manga. Um, I actually have all the manga that's available in English. Um, really, really a uh, uh, huge fan of that, uh, that franchise. And, um, uh, well, huge fan in the sense that I bought a bunch of the manga. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so I checked out the new anime series, and that was really nice. Um, uh, great, um, update where it's still staying true to the sort of horror vibe of the original, um, while making it more like a modern horror, uh, tone. Uh, it's more, you know, creepy psychological horror, as opposed to the sort of in-your-face monsters kind of horror. Um, of, of earlier versions, and the character designs have been updated to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more modern in the sense that you know the um, especially the side characters are made more, um, more visually appealing to, to modern sensibilities. So, which is nice, and they, I mean, they change that a lot. Um, every version of Kitaro has tweaked the character designs and updated it to um, um, to be more appropriate for modern audiences, um, which I think is is a good idea. You know, you don't want to lose your complete identity doing that, but it makes sense to tweak things to say, okay, well, visual aesthetics have, have shifted over time, and uh, we can appeal more to the modern audience by just changing the eye shape a little bit and things like that. Um, so yeah, so I'm totally up with that. What bookshelves would you recommend for manga collectors? Not these. I will tell you that, that much. Um, I don't know if you can tell. Um, that's probably the worst one uh, over here. So these are Walmart specials. They were like 30 bucks each. Um, and they're incredibly cheap wood. And they're just terrible. Um, uh, and they're only like two years old. Uh, and they started bowing within like six months. So really bad. Um, in fact, the reason there is, you can probably, it's a little hard to see. Um, there's a uh, piece of wood here, a block of wood, um, because the, the top piece cracked, literally broke. Um, so I started to put that up there to, uh, to support it, and thus there's pretty much no weight on there, just some plastic um, models and resin uh, models. Um, but so yeah, I would definitely um, build your own or go for something like really extensive, something, something that's well built and well constructed. I, I think building your own makes sense. I really like the collapsible ones where they're on hinges so you can sort of fold them out, you know, and, and build as much as you want and then fold them back up so if you move, you know, you don't have to 
move giant bookcases. You can kind of you know collapse them flat and move like all your bookcases all at once. I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, that might actually literally be a workshop Wednesday, you know, mini series. <laughs> um, now that I've built the table, um, so I don't know how much you guys saw. Um, do I have? Let me pull up some photos. Um, this was one of my projects, um, a project f uh, for me from uh, last week. Let me see here. Let's see if I can get to show you some pictures here. Um, I can pull this. I just got to switch this over. Uh, no, no. There we go. Um, so this was my project um, a couple of weeks ago to build a basically a DMing table. Um, so this is a wood table with a screen in the middle of it um, uh, for for D and D. So I can display maps and such like that for the for the players. So I built that, um, and now that I've done that and I know I can do that, uh, now I don't have to worry as much about the idea of building bookcases and them all falling apart. So I might literally just build some nice bookcases um, and show you all how I did that. It'd be cool to figure out some way of doing... Um, yeah, and, and I agree, folding book, bookshelves usually not tall. Um, I think partly because when people think folding bookcases, they assume they should be... Um, they should fold up small, where I'm okay with a bookcase that is tall and folds up, um, and then, you know, it's still... You know, eight feet or whatever, because I can still pack that into a truck, whatever. Um, so I might do that. Um, you know, figure out some way of building large, collapsible bookcases. It'd be cool to figure out some way of doing that in a way that's um, um, not interchangeable, but where you can have like like interlocking bookcases. So you could have, um, uh, you know, well, interlocking bookcases. So they kind of support each other. But I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Um, maybe, huh. Typically what I've done is just screw them together. So they're literally screws in, this, in the sides of each of those panels to hold them together so they, they have more, more um, uh, connection. But there have gotta be better ways of doing it. Um, stackable modular wooden shelves. Cool, appreciate that, uh, Charming Sketches. And obviously there are many, many people out there working on <laughs> On, on these sorts of problems. So I'm probably not the only one to, to think about that, uh, that thing. The other thing is, um, and this is a, a, a significant thing for us, manga collectors, we typically don't have, I mean, manga is typically short. You know, I'm wasting a lot of bookshelf space down here because these books, you know, the, the manga aren't all 12 inches tall. Some of them are, but... Um, yeah, so we'll see. And part of the problem is some of the, some of the modular stuff kind of assumes lighter things that you're storing in them. Um, you know, they, they are stackable, but they would kind of fall apart if you had a lot of heavy stuff in them. So that's another thing that I'll have to, to figure out and play around with. Um, but yeah, it would be really cool to have some kind of modular system, especially for manga, because manga, you know, our, our collections grow fairly quickly. Um, you know, a new manga series comes out, you want to collect that. You know, you know, you get into an older series and there are 38 volumes. So, you know, we need to really figure out something, something that makes sense. So it'd be a fun, like, group project, maybe. Um, yeah, that's the thing, Solari. It's like they assume folks don't put books on bookshelves. And granted, a lot of folks don't, right? Um, a lot of people have shelves, um, but they don't really read. So they have the shelves for other things. And granted, I, you know, I use shelves for storage, D&D um, &D stuff, but... Um, uh, yeah, very, very quickly those manga collections can grow. And that's the other thing, actually, is um, it would be cool to make them modular because you could then build stuff that is of different heights. So, you know, uh, Akira up there, those are big volumes, um, and I need height for those. And, like, um, I'd like, like to do the same thing for my D&D &D stuff, and those are pretty tall books. So if I could have shelves that are of different, you know, different... Uh, different heights, that would be really, really cool. Um, even the, the bookshelves with the little pegs, there are spaces in there where there are no peg holes, and you could drill holes in there for those. 
Um, but still, it's not really ideal, and you only have so many shelves in, in, in that. Um, back when I had a really large book collection, like novels and such, um, I would actually have um, like seven or eight shelves in one bookcase because I had a lot of like paperbacks, and I could just stack those. You know, I had a, I'd have like eight inch high shelves and just sort of stack it in. But then again, you want good <laughs> bookcases for that. Uh, vacuum pack them on into bricks and then uh, do that. There we go. I love it. Um, DVD shelves are good for manga sometimes because the size of a DVD is s similar but the weight is different. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly, Cornish uh, Cream Tea. And hey, good to see you. Um, the problem is, you know, I, I have Roni Kenshin back there and that's 28 volumes. Right, if you want that, and that is a that is a pretty continuous story. Right, obviously there's episodic stuff in there, but um, you know, uh, Kenjin does not have a lot of fat story-wise, in the sense that you are revealing more about his character and revealing more about his backstory and kind of and and seeing different villains and how they relate to, to Kenjin. So um, that's a big deal, and especially if you're into like the, the the bigger shonen series. You know, let me just check here. One sec. Um, let me see here. Um, One Piece is currently up to 95 volumes. 95 volumes if you're collecting One Piece. So that's, that's a, you know, that's a whole bookcase right there. <laughs> Practically. Oh, cool. Thank you, Matt. So Anderson Monogatari... Um, were anime ad adaptations of Hans Christian Andersen's stories in 1971, and as far as we know, the first anime adaptation of uh, classic Western literature. Interesting. Interesting. And that was, you know, eight years after Astro Boy, so pretty early on in, uh, in, in the anime world. Um, yeah, Omnibus Edition, obviously that, that helps too. Cool, Charmy. I don't think you can uh, paste uh, URLs and links in the chat here. So go ahead and paste that in the Discord, and uh, that should be fine. Yeah, 95 volumes is its own library. There we are. So, um, so yeah, that would be, be a fun challenge. Come up with some uh, you know, really good modular um, shelving system for manga. And other stuff as well. Mm. That's a good idea, is you... Um, um, if I were smart, <laughs> um, I would be mixed mediaing this because all of these books are really heavy. And so if I had some other things mixed in with the manga, um, I just, I, I like minimalism and I'm pursuing minimalism. So I'm trying to kind of condense everything down. Um, over on the other side, I have a bunch of like D and D miniatures and terrain, um, on some of the shelves. And so that helps a lot there. Um, but I'm trying not to have lots of of open shelf space. I'd rather just have space. Um, oh good, she's using it specifically for books. That's good to know. Um, so yeah, I think that'll, that might be the next project. I have a, a few more things to do on that table that I showed before. Um, I need to, I'm gonna put a, uh, a wooden top in to sit down on top of the screen. So there'll be like a protective acrylic sheet on top of the screen and then you know padding and then the uh, um, the, the, the wooden top that will fit in on top of the screen. So I still have that to do probably next week. But then maybe after that, I'll start on uh, some, uh, a nice bookcase replacement uh, project. It'll be fun to project, but fun to, to deal. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, and the other thing about the omnibuses is they're often larger, which is nice. So, you know, you, you start collecting the original volumes, but then the omnibus comes out and you can actually see the art in, in more detail in the omnibus edition, um, which is cool too. Um, but it's not quite the same as the original volumes, right? The original volumes, um, you know, were how it came out in Japan, so you get more of the the, the original experience with the, the full-scale volumes. I don't know. Um, hmm. Yeah, the metal rolling shelves, that's true. Um, unfortunately, I cannot do metal work here. You are looking at my workshop. Like, this is where I do all my woodworking. Um, and you can see it's like carpet, you know? 
um, with a, like a tarp. Um, so uh, I can't exactly do any TIG welding here. That is, that is one of my, uh, my drawbacks. I just don't have, even if I had the, uh, the stuff, I just could not do metal, metal work here. Um, but yeah, hmm. One of these days. One of these days. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. I'm also honestly moving more towards digital manga. And I know, I know. Um, but I love having, um, <laughs> metal fatigue, there we are. Um, I love just having access to a huge amount of manga in a, in a tablet. Um, and just not having all these manga that I know I'm gonna have to transport the next time I move and all that kind of stuff. The idea of having all of these manga, um, you know, poof into a digital format that I can just take with me everywhere is kind of appealing. Um... And yeah, I know all of the, the downsides of digital and you don't really own it and all that kind of stuff, but still. Mm. Yeah, the spines on an omnibus can, can be hard. I'm really, really careful with my possessions. Um, you know, I don't damage stuff and I'm a... Um, uh, there's a saying that a book lovers come in two types. There are the, um, the, the passionate book lovers and there are the intellectual book lovers. So the passionate book lovers are um, um, are, are very physical with their books, uh, and and they you know they, they dog ear them and they highlight them and they you know they they, they creak, you know pull them open on the spines and all that kind of stuff. And so they're they're very uh, um, very forceful in their love, um, you know knights of wild passion with their books. Um, whereas you know, others are much more, you know, careful and respectful and things don't, you know, you, you just don't do that with books. I'm definitely the latter type. Um, so, um, so my omnibuses, let me see, um, I guess. I don't have a lot of, like, omnibuses, to be honest. Um, well, like, oh, there's, there's Lucifer. So, you know, my Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer omnibus, you know, no problem at all. There, there's really no, no significant damage on that one. Um, by the way, if you're looking for a, uh, a shonen series, it's sort of a classic shonen um, uh, concept, but executes on its uh, elements well, Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer. Love this, and it's a total of... Uh, uh, ten volumes originally, five omnibus, and uh, this is just really, really fun work. Um, and then Ghost in the Shell, similar, um, again, technically an omnibus, although this is how it was released, um, period, over here. I don't think, no, I think there were, like, releases of the individuals, but, yeah, if you take care of them, it's not a big deal. Ah, uh, interesting, Charmy. You, uh, um, you, you get a paperback to annotate. That makes sense. Never thought of that. That's cool. Um, what do you do with digital manga when you finish reading? They're just there in the library. Um, so I have a lot of Kindle manga, and they're just there in on, on my Kindle library. I can go back to them at any time, um, and they're just there, um, which is one of the things I like. Um, I do have some 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 books that has PDFs and. Moby and e-reader and, and, and such, and those are all backed up on, a, on, a, on my shared drive. Um, ah, page flags, cool. Yeah, I've used post-its in the past to kind of notate things, but then I'm, I rarely buy books that I'm like reading to um, analyze in that way. So normally if, I'm, if, if, if I have something that I want to like take notes on or whatever, I'll write those down separately. So I'll have pages of notes, but I won't actually change the book. Interesting. That's just my, you know, uh, my take. It's not necessarily better or worse. Um, that's interesting. I should probably try that at some point. Like, you know, bookmark um, important passages, things like that, important uh, things. Um, the other thing is, honestly, I am not one of these people who goes back and rereads manga a lot. Um, I don't feel like I need to have access to all the manga I've ever read at all times. You know, um, I read 
What's a good example? Um, Color of Rage. I actually have a copy of that back there. And I'm glad I read it. It was a really interesting manga. Um, if I never read it again, that's fine. Right? Like, there's plenty of other manga to read. Um, and most of my manga is like that, where I can, I can read it once, maybe, maybe come back to it at some point, if, especially if I'm going to do a review. But in general, not a, not a huge, huge deal. And that's the other thing, as Matt points out, Matt Owens, um, a lot, you know, an increasing amount of manga is only really being released digitally because it's, it's cheaper, right? And a lot of these smaller titles that aren't going to get a huge response out of people, it makes sense to license those digitally only, release those. And if they get big, you can do a print run. Um, but that, you know, there are some things you can only get digitally now. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, manga story pacing is important. If you're interested, do I have it here? Um, where is that? I may not still have it, that copy of that. Um, uh, there is a book specifically about that. Oh, maybe it's down here. Probably, there it is. Um, no, that's, that's not it. There it is. Um, you may have already heard of this, but Manga in Theory and Practice, The Craft of Creating Manga, is a book exactly about that. Um, a theoretical, um, or literally a written book about how to structure manga, written by the creator of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. This is his treatise on how to write manga that appeals to people. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, he, he certainly has succeeded, right? Like this is, this is an expert, so this is your, your master class on manga theory and practice, and I found this to be very useful. Um, so anyone who's interested in, in kind of how manga is, you know, structured from a story perspective and how to make characters that will appeal to people, really interesting read. Um, do I have hardbound manga? A few. Um, typically when it's only available that way. Um, so I have um, Ayako in hardback, uh, Osama Tezuka manga. Um, I have uh, several volumes, actually most volumes of Buddha I have in hardback, and I wish I had more, but uh, they released it in hardback first, then paperback, and the hardback immediately became a collector's item. That is a really, those, those became very hard to find and very expensive. So um, I got the first four volumes hardback and the last volume hardback, and then those middle three, I mean, they're going to be 50 bucks each last time I checked, so I'm not willing to do, uh, go to that. Um, yep, it was uh, Manga in Theory and Practice, The Craft of Creating Manga. That is that book, if anyone's interested in that. Um, those might be the only hardback manga. No, I have a few others. Um, but they're typically things that were, again, like only released in hardback. And so I was like, yep, I'll, I'll grab those. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they styled it a bit like uh, the JoJo hardbacks. Um, for that, but uh, so yeah, a few of them exist. Um, I'm I'm personally not like um, I don't feel like I need to keep a manga collection for all time. I am not a collector in that sense, so I don't feel like you know I would rather have the hardback version of something. Um, you know, the paperback versions are are fine by me um, in general. So um, I don't seek out the hardbacks, personally. But I can see why people would. The hardbacks will certainly last longer. Although, granted, I have not had problems with paperback manga falling apart. You know, obviously one or two here and there um, that that'll happen to. But there, there, it's more, you know, just that that volume didn't get bound very well. Um, it's not because, generally speaking, the production process was terrible. Cool. Glad to hear it, Charlie Snatches. Um, now then, there's a question of what. Uh, what manga I wish I had in hardback, you know, the, the manga that I would like to kind of preserve. Um, those would be um, Akira, oddly enough, uh, because Akira is very inspiring from an artistic perspective in terms of how Otomo um, renders his uh, panels, how he tells his story. I find Akira is one of those manga that I will go back to occasionally um, to uh, just to study kind of how he does that. And not because I think Akira is, like, Akira is far from my favorite manga. Um, it's just very much its own thing. And um, 
Um, and it is extremely good at what it does. What else? Um, Blam for the same reason, or blame. Um, Blam is just, well, let me show you. Let me show you some stuff from further into the manga, um, stuff that uh, was not in the, uh, in the original. Um, and make sure this is all uh, appropriate, but um, just the way Otomo shows off his environments, how you'll kind of zoom in on things, how he'll compare and contrast different imagery, um, I find just really interesting and inspiring. And then, um, you know, Blame just has this, uh, this, uh, this amazing, um, and that's not a great example, one second. Um, just this architecture, visual sense of place that I find really interesting. Um, and just kind of the, the weird body horror of that is really cool. Um, so this is the kind of art that, again, you can kind of uh, see here. Um, and this is a little sketchier than his, than his uh, later artwork. But you can really study this artwork and just pay attention to how he renders some of the stuff. Um, and I think it's just really cool. Um, by the way, these are like cyborgs and stuff. So you see them getting blown apart. There's, it's not real people, so it's fine. Hey, Game Escape. So those are ones that I wouldn't mind having in hardback, just because I, um, I would like those to, to last for a while. Yeah, Akira is a big place in manga anime history. And the thing about Akira is I don't think that one has to love it or hate it. Um, it's kind of like... Um, the Godfather, or um, Citizen Kane. You know, you can watch those movies and appreciate them for what they are. Um, and if you don't like mob movies, that's fine, right? You don't have to love The Godfather. You don't have to be entertained by The Godfather. You can watch it and go, "Wow, I see why people like this. I, I see why this was influential." That's totally cool. Um, yeah, exactly, William A. Um, uh, um, Blame stuff is very um, H.R. Giger esque. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of inspiration there. A lot of, uh, again, sort of body horror, weird creatures, um, sort of vaguely humaniform, uh, creatures that then get, you know, generally blown to pieces. Um, and as the manga goes on, it gets kind of, that gets uh, stronger and stronger, um, as he has to create more and more weird things, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. For manga lovers, go to a library and check out manga. You can, yeah, that's a good point. Um, um, a lot of libraries are really smart these days about trying to maintain a manga collection. And the problem is you'll, they will nev never be complete, um, even within a series. Unfortunately, one of the downsides of manga is, you know, someone will check out volumes one and two and then never return them um, because it's kids. So... You're not going to have a lot of that stuff, um, but you can go there and get a, a sense for a lot of different manga. So if you're curious about, you know, Kakapta Sakura or Jojo's Bizarre Adventure or whatever, you can go and check out, you know, a dozen different volumes from different series, and you're going to start in, you know, volume five, but you can at least get a sense of the artwork, a sense of the story, and go in. That's a really good idea. Do I have any bookmarks or do I use makeshift ones? I have just like a handful of... Actually, um, Amazon um, bookmarks. So back when Amazon was young, um, they would often include a little cardboard bookmark or a little cardstock bookmark with your orders, um, especially if you ordered like more than, I don't know, $25 worth of books or something. They just put a little uh, um, bookmark. Let's see if I can... I... So this is back when um, Amazon was still trying to convince people to, to buy there. Um, so this is one of their early bookmarks. 
I don't know if they still have these available, I'm not sure. Um, lovely artwork and then a quote on there. The test of literature is, I suppose, whether we ourselves live more intensely for the reading of it. Elizabeth Drew. And then this nice one. I like blue. When you sell a man a book, you don't sell him 12 ounces of paper and ink and glue. You sell him a whole new life. Christopher Morley. So I have a few of these hanging around and I use these. But generally speaking, I'll be honest, um, it's rare that I sit down with a manga um, and then put it down before I'm done with it. Um, you know, I may pause halfway through a, a manga and go and get, grab some tea or something. But... Yeah. Ooh, a book holder. That's a good idea. I should probably build a book holder or something. That is a problem I have. I often have, you know, um, I'm often eating or something and I want to read while I'm eating. That'd be cool. It might be collector's items. That's true. Um, how do I plan to store manga long term so they won't degrade? Um, my view is they will degrade. I, I'm not trying to prevent degradation of manga. And I have a few now that have uh, been around a while. Um, so, for example, let me take that. And so here is my copy of uh, Astro Boy Volume 1. And you can see the yellowing of the pages. And you can compare that to... Um, Ancient Magic's Bride, Volume 8, right, so that's just a thing, that's just a reality I'm going to have to live with on these, because um, this is basically newsprint for, for these releases, so I'm going to live with that. Um, and obviously I'm not like, you know, leaving them in vats of acid out in the sun. You know, I'm not trying to destroy them, but I just gotta live with that. And you know, the reality is the sun comes in and shines on some of these books. And I'm not gonna keep all of my books, you know, um, locked away in a, in a closet somewhere uh, or keep them, you know, really hidden away from the sunlight. Um, I could, but it's one of those, eh, at what point are you really living your life or are you just protecting your books? Um, I, I can live with, with the fact that some of my books are going to be, be yellowed and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's only so much one can do. Um, so let's see here. I'm just going to check things a little bit. Do, 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 check out, um, anything more. That's right. So in about half an hour, I'm going to go into the kitchen and we're going to do some cooking. Oh yeah, Understanding Comics, uh, Chummy Sketches. If you haven't already read that, uh, Understanding Comics is an absolutely fantastic, absolutely um, extremely helpful look at how to, how to write comics. That's, you know, a lot of comic artists are aware of Understanding Comics, but it, it is worth bringing up for the, the ones, you know, uh, those who haven't heard of it, Understanding Comics is the encyclopedia for that. Or the starting point, if you will. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, a lot of uh, folks who would collect comics, comics, will like Mylar bag them and so forth, but I'm not that person. Actually, you know, last night I, t I showed you the thing from Toy Galaxy, um, the, the guy who, who does, all that, does all the toy stuff, and he did a video recently where he said, so I've sold a bunch of my toys recently because I realized I love toys and I love researching them and I love, you know, going through them. But I'm not one of those people who collects them in the sense of having, you know, an encyclopedic museum level collection of everything in a given line. You know, um, I will have um, um, certain toys and certain things, but I'm okay with not having everything in a line. Um, you know, I have there are pluses and minuses. Um, but yeah, it's it's really. Um, 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 you know, I, I'm not one of those people who, who needs to have, you know, all of Astro Boy in mint condition for me for the rest of my life. That's just not, you know, that's just not me. And I'm glad there are people doing that, right? I, I, that's not at all 
looking down on folks who are doing that preservation work. It's really cool and important, but just not something that I'm, uh, um, this is not me. Um, and it's one of the cool things. Again, it's why I love talking about anime and manga and so forth, because we have different people with different goals. Um, and some folks are trying to keep those long-term copies of things. Um, and some folks are, you know, they have the big physical collection. Some folks are like all digital. You know, they own basically nothing. Um, and it's just different, different strokes for different folks, right? That's totally fine. Um, all right, so let's uh, do a little trivia here. And I want to try this out to see if we can, uh, you know, now that things are a little faster, would you like to go faster? I'm hoping that this can go a little easier. Um, I'll just have to pull up the images again, uh, which should be in here. There we are. And I think if I pull up um, that one. I should still be able to go. Yeah, there we go. Um, all right, let's see if we can do this. So let's just do a little trivia here for a little bit and see if this is any better with a faster chat. Um, so if I just switch over to here, there we are. So we'll see if we get any guesses here. Does anyone know the studio that animated Puella Magi Madoka Magica? Any guesses on that one? Um, a lot of folks know Madoka Magica, but get into a little bit of, of production questions. Yep, Cornish Cream Tea, you got it, Shaft. Definitely a Shaft anime, because as fans, you get shafted. Um, who can name Makoto Shinkai's first feature-length animation? Not his first animation, that would be his first feature-length animation. Um, Shinkai now doing a lot of film work, got started doing short films. So the first one that's feature length, and for reference, feature length means over an hour in length. Yeah, that's the thing, you know. A lot of these are featured in the weekly stream, but if you weren't paying attention, you're, 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 you're lost out. Anyone know? We'll see if we get any more guesses here. Yeah, this is a little tricky. Voice of Innocent Star was his first, actually it was not his first animation. His first animation was um, A Girl, A Cat, and My Letter, but that was only a few minutes long. Voice of Innocent Star is not, not feature length. Seven centimeters per second, perhaps. Oops, that's my phone. I need to silence that. Sorry about that. It was the place promised in our early days. One moment. There we are. So, yes. A lesser known Makoto Shinkai work. For better or worse. Uh, better or, or, or worse. Uh, how about this? The author of Shaman King got his start assisting in what major shonen series? And I think I've mentioned this in the past on the live stream. Um, because it's one of the things that got me interested in Shaman King was the origin of its creator. And you can see that influence in Shaman King. Um, if you look for it and you think about the you know, the manga of like the 90s, early 90s that might have, uh, might have inspired it. And that might, uh, might jump at you. That's right, JJ, you got it. Rurouni Kenshin was uh, where he got his start. And there's definitely a Kenshin vibe in Shaman King. Uh, who can name this character from Harui Suzumiya? An easy one for those of you who watched the series, but... Uh, if you've only seen it once, maybe the, the name might slip your mind. Ah, Solari's right on it. Well, no, well done. Mikuru Asahina from Haruhi Suzumiya. Poor Mikuru. Um, all right, here's, a, here's a, a tougher one. One for the fans. What are the names of all three Madoka Magica movies? 
all three. Yeah, me, 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 Karubim. When Haruhi came out, there were a lot of great memes of uh, people intercutting. So they do the Mikurubim, then they cut to some, you know, giant colony laser from Gundam or whatever firing. But those are fun. Oh, uh, yeah. Hard to remember the names of all three of them. Again, no, no Googling, no searching. Yeah, folks are having a tough time with this one. Fair enough. So the answer is Beginnings Eternal and Rebellion. Beginnings Eternal and Rebellion. All three of them. All right. Who can name the protagonist of Fairy Tale? The main guy from Fairy Tale. One of these ones. That, again, I would not know this. Couldn't, couldn't help you on this one. A lot of characters in Fairy Tale, but who is that pink haired guy from Fairy Tale? Solari's got it. That's Natsu. Natsu Dragnil from Fairy Tale. Fun Shonen series. Um, all right, for you Gundam fans, and then some who may be a little familiar, um, what did Gundam Age do differently than other Gundam series? They did something special with their story structure. that you don't see, you didn't see in any other Gundam series. Anyone know what that might be? Well done, Solari. Gundam Age was a generational anime. It's divided into three sort of sub-seasons, and each season deals with a further generation, the, the kids of the previous generation of, uh, of the characters. It's an interesting, uh, interesting take. Also aimed at a, a younger audience than a lot of other Gundam series at the time. All right, um, here's a tough one. What anime series were they making in Shirobako in the early episodes of the anime series? For those who don't know, Shirobako is an anime set at an anime studio where they're actually making anime. Uh, so that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty meta. Anyone remember the name of the, the Magical Girl series they were making there? Yeah, this is, this is not easy. This is a tough one. I cannot have, have, uh, have told you this one off the top of my head. Yeah, not seeing folks jumping in on this one. <laughs> Fair enough. This is, uh, this is rough. Even, even hardcore fans, I think, will not know this one. Um, Exodus was the Magical Girl series they were making. Um, and all the problems they were having with the uh, um, later episodes of Exodus. And I think if you remember, if you hear about that, you uh, you hear, you know, remember them saying Exodus in that anime series. Uh, all right, how about this one for those of you who've seen Gargantia on the Virgin's Planet? Anyone, anyone remember the name of the main mecha? Um, voiced by Matt Mercer of Critical Role, the great Matt Mercer, done a lot of uh, anime and video game roles besides. DMing Critical Role. Anyone remember the name of the, the mecha in Gargantia? Because uh, he had a very important role in that show. Gargantia is really an interesting uh, sci-fi series. Um, it may come across as just kind of a typical mecha thing, but um, it's more of like a classic sci-fi story. Um, you know, dealing with some interesting sort of political stuff and what it means to be human and all that kind of stuff which I uh, liked a lot. And if you've seen Gargantia and can't remember, when I reveal it, you're going to be like, ah, dang. Oh. But, uh, yeah. Which would be me as well. I could not tell you this off the top of my head. But the answer is... Chamber. That's right. Probably every episode, at some point, the protagonist there goes, you know, Chamber. Blah, 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 blah. Ah, uh, well. Which, and it's a, it's a good name, you know? The, the pilot is in, encased in it. it. It is literally a chamber for the pilot. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, all right, Canon. Very, very well-known anime series, very well-respected anime series. When did that come out? What year did the Kyoto Animation adaptation of Canon come out? 
Again, no Googling. 2006, folks are saying. That's right. Well done. Almost 15 years ago, we got the, uh, what is widely considered to be the canonical anime adaptation of um, arguably the greatest visual novel you know, ever made. I mean, you know, um, certainly uh, Japanese fans are like, that's, that's the one. Like if you're going to watch, you're going to play a visual novel, that canon's the one to play. All right. How about Air? When did Air air? What year did that come out? A little tougher on that one. Was it before? Was it after? Mm. When did we get Air? For those who remember the, uh, their, their timelines, this won't be too difficult. Yeah, Cornish Cream Tea, you have, you know your, your visual novel history. They did Air first and then Canon the year after. And then what about Clonade? So you get Clonade, was that before, after? What was, what was the timeline on all that? Yeah, when did Air Air? Any guesses on Clonade? For those who lived through this, they will, they'll, they'll know this one. Because uh, Kyoto Animation animating some of these visual, great visual novels was a big deal at the time. The fact that they were all coming out um, and being adapted pretty solidly. 2007. Cornish Cream Tea, slightly off, but understandable. Uh, I think there was, there was a, I think Clonade After Story was 08. I may be thinking of. Let's do one more. Um, Sailor Moon, technically a spinoff of what manga? So, when Sailor Moon came out, um, it was um, because the staff had read an earlier manga by the same author and invited her in and said, we want to do something kind of similar to this, but we want to switch it around. And so Sailor Moon became sort of a spin-off of an earlier work by the same, same manga author. Yeah, not as you didn't know, Joe. <laughs> Though that would be hilarious. Um, I wish that were the answer. Sadly not. But I believe, yep, Charmy Sketch is very, very good. Codename Sailor V was the original. And, um, in fact, I'm going to show you something real, real cool. Let me uh, switch back here. Oh, I may not have it anymore. Um, no, I do. So this is Codename Sailor V. Um, they basically redid... Um, so th this came out, and uh, Sailor V is this... Magical girl who goes around, you know, fighting things, and there's a, you know, there's a cat, and all that basic stuff is there. Um, and the eventual staff of the manga apparently read this and um, uh, called in uh, Takeuchi and said, um, we really like this, but we want to do a, um, a magical girl series that's team-based. Uh, so we'd like to kind of re rework this into a team story um, and we want the, you know, the main character to be a little more ditzy and so forth, so they, they reworked all of it. And what's cool and uh, kind of crazy, um, as she is doing her story at one point, uh, that's not it, that's not it, um, she's just really enjoying kind of her magical girl life. And I'll see if I can find this moment here. Um, so, you know, Sailor V obviously becomes Sailor Venus and that character in, um, in Sailor Moon. But there is a moment. Maybe that's not it. Maybe it's not in here. It's in the other one. Um, could have sworn. Um, 
No. This is annoying. That thing where you're like, oh, I'll just find the thing. And it'll be, it'll be all, I'll be good. But it's not immediately obvious. Um... <sighs> Dang it. But as I recall, there's a moment here where she's running down the street. Um, again, sort of enjoying her life, doing her thing. Um, and she runs past Serena. Um, and so you, know, you see Serena from Sailor Moon there. And it's very bittersweet because you realize, oh, this is the moment at which the protagonist of this manga is going to get completely overshadowed by a completely different character. You know, and you're like, ah, you know, I may have been enjoying this manga, but, you know, it's going to be over uh, at some point. Um, let me just see. I thought it was later on. Maybe I just skipped it. Um, it's hard because Sailor V looks a lot like Sailor Moon, obviously. Um, you know, her, her character design is fairly similar um, and same outfit, obviously, and such. Um... And it's not here in the last few panels. Oh, well. But, yeah, Usagi, Serena, whatever. Right. Um, but, yeah. Kind of cool. If you're into your Sailor Moon history, Sailor V is interesting and worth, worth picking up. Um, I mean, it's, it's typical Magical Girl stuff, right? It's very Sailor Moon. Um, all righty. Yeah, people get very, very concerned about the names in Sailor Moon, and it's not, you know, it's, it's not, it's not this name, it's that name, you know, Japanese names forever, and I'm, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a dog in that fight, so I don't, I don't get that, uh, that worked up about that stuff. However, it is time for a giveaway. Uh, let's see here, let's pull something from the giveaway pile. I'm not giving away Ghost in the Shell, sorry, um, the, the manga, I am, uh, anyway, we already gave it a giveaway. Um, I think what we'll do is, um, oh, you know, we, we, we did some Gundam stuff. I have an extra copy of the entirety of Victory Gundam. All 50 episodes, 51 episodes, excuse me, of Victory Gundam. Um, uh, interesting Gundam series. This is the fourth Gundam anime series. Mobile Suit Gundam, Zeta, Double Zeta, and then Victory. Um, and um, I've seen the first... Ten episodes of Victory, and I will let you know. Um, this is the anime series in which um, Yoshiki Tomino introduces all sorts of characters that you will care about, and then kills them off one by one. Um, there is basically a good guy death like every other episode in uh, in Victory Gundam. Um, in some cases, every episode. Um, they just keep introducing characters and just killing them off, one after the other. Um, also, um, a number of the characters are, are children. Um, not necessarily the ones that die, but like uh, a lot of the, the early characters are kids caught up in this war. Um, um, uh, what is his name? Uso. Um, Uso there is, I think, 12? Something like that. So a very young uh, pilot. And, um, um, and he goes around with some, some other kids. What I like is they do a good job of portraying what it's like when kids get involved in a war. And they're, you know, they're, they're basically, they're, they're kind of street rats that, that are... Um, tagging along with these, these folks who are fighting guerrilla actions. Um, and so, like, they, they help out as much as they can, but, like, they're not really, you know, good combatants. Um, yeah, Kill'em All Tomino is very... He, he earns his, uh, his name here. Um, 13, okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, I think, I think the, the girl is... Uh, I think uh, the girl there is, I think, 12 um, or younger. Anyway, um... Um, I really liked what I saw of Victory Gundam. Um, I thought they did a good job of balancing the um, um, the various characters against each other, the the amount of plot and so forth. It is a, one of those shows that kind of you know uh, drops you into the plot, and then you have to pick out and understand who the various sides are and and uh, what they're doing from how characters are talking about what's going on. You know, there's no, there's I don't believe there's any opening narration that says it is the year X Y Z. These people are doing this and that and that. Of course, I say that and it might be in there. Um, apparently, though, as the, the series goes on, it gets a lot darker and a lot, a lot more tragic. Um, so, that is the thing. The Children's War. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, I'm giving away the entire, the entirety of Victory Gundam. Not because I didn't like it, because I accidentally bought two copies. 
<laughs> which happens sometimes. Um, so I will get through uh, Victory Gundam at some point. Um, so I'm going to do that, and as before, we're going to use the die of genres, and um, I'm going to throw that up here, and if you guess the genre, then congratulations. Um, I will roll the die. That is a different one than we got before, so that's good. Um, so go ahead and guess the genre, if you would, in the chat there. <clears throat> and whoever guesses the genre will get Victory Gundam shipped to them. No one's got it yet. It is definitely one of them. It's definitely, um, it's definitely, you know, one of the items on that list. Don't have it yet. Ambiguous cake, congratulations. Sports is indeed, a little hard to read, but that is definitely sports. So well done, ambiguous cake. Please DM me on Discord with your mailing address and I will be shipping out to you, probably sometime next week, a copy of Victory Gundam. So enjoy. Yeah, I did not include certain genres on here. I'm just gonna note down the winner so I don't forget who this goes to. And that goes over there on the side. Um, we have a few other giveaway uh, things, a few other um, uh, uh, anime and manga to give away, but that will uh, that will come later on in the uh, uh, in the weekend. Meanwhile, uh, let's see here. We did that. Um, it is time for lunch. I'm gonna make some cookies, but I need to move all of this into there. So. Uh, we're going to shift over into there. Fang of the Sun Dogrum is currently playing over on SciTube. This is, speaking of, of Gundam, uh, after Gundam came out and kind of proved that Real Robot was a, a thing, then uh, Sunrise decided to make another Real Robot, another serious grounded mecha series, and that was Fang of the Sun Dogrum. It's not a Gundam series, but it is sort of the Gundam concept of more gritty, grounded um, mecha um, done as its own original anime series, 1980, I believe, or 81. And um, really interesting, sort of a, a more Vietnam-esque concept of this uh, remote planet and these guerrilla fighters, not guerrillas as in, <laughs> but guerrilla as in G-U-E, G-U-E-U, whatever, guerrilla fighters. Um, really, really interesting. Um, all right, so, cool, and Brad will be starting trivia in about an hour. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to switch over to um, the feed over there in a few minutes. So please stand by.
All right, I think we're back with more time for some cooking. I'm gonna make some cookies. We're gonna bake. Um, and I'm gonna teach you a very, very simple method of making and baking basically a shortbread cookie, like a sugar cookie, crisp cookie, uh, which you can then vary in all sorts of really cool ways. And it uses basically three core ingredients, which is one of the things I like about it. So we're gonna start with some butter, some beurre, stick of butter, which is uh, four ounces of butter. We're gonna go there. And have some sugar and some flour. Now, here's the thing. Um, oh, I need flour as well. There we are. One of the things I love about this recipe is that cookies, this basic shortbread cookie recipe, is one part sugar by weight, two parts butter, three parts flour. So if you have four ounces of butter, that's two ounces of sugar, four ounces of butter, six ounces of flour. Add a little salt just to improve the flavor. Salt always bumps up the flavor. Cookies. Boom. Two sticks of butter, double all the other ingredients. I'm gonna make fewer, have all the ingredients. Um, and then, if you want to have fun and make like softer cookies, then you have less flour, you substitute white sugar for brown sugar, for example, add more sugar, you can play around and do some really cool things. So, let me grab my mixer. Don't know if you'll be able to see the mixer from there. Let's see here. Nope. A little bit. I move this. In. Oh yeah, perfect. So what I'm going to do here is plug that in, and again I'm going to mix by weight. So actually, let me move some of these out of the way. The mixer moves over here. This, oh, I got a few little, few little things I want to clean out of there. Yep, cool. Just gonna, it's been a while since I used the mixer, so I'm just gonna clean out the, uh, the inside of that. It's been in the pantry, and you know, pantry gets dusty. I should probably clean, uh, store this like uh, upside down or something so the you know, dust doesn't fall in the bowl. Now that I think about it, I think I'll do that from now on. Okay, there we go. So we have that. Oh, a little, uh, little soap on the side there. Didn't notice that. Clean that off. Okay. Get that as dry as you can. Then we will start cooking. Let me get a little more light going here. The oven's already preheated to 350, um, which is around what you need for cookies in general. Um, yeah, exactly. This is this is a thing you don't get a lot of other cons. Um, so we know we we want to do the butter now. If you just put the butter in there cold. Um, that's going to affect your cookies. It's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but I find it just a little harder to work with. So I'm just going to put this in the microwave for like 10 seconds. Not enough to melt it, but just enough to get it a little softer. So it'll incorporate a little more easily. And again, because we're working with weights, we know we want one part, two part, three part. We have our two parts of butter, four ounces. So we only want uh, one part, two ounces of sugar. I'm just going to go ahead and put that in there. Whoa! I have, whoops, a little bit too much there. A lot of clumps in this. 
1.95, And one easy way to remember, remember the, uh, the ratio here of sugar to butter to, uh, to flour is that when sugar melts, when sugar gets hot, it turns liquid, right? It turns into like caramel and it turns into like a sugar syrup. Or have you ever, you ever seen that? Um, and while butter melts, it is a binding agent, effectively. Um, so you want as little sugar as possible. If you had, if you sw swapped these around and had more sugar than butter, you'd have a, um, um, a much more wet thing. It'd be incredibly sweet and it would not bind together very well. So you want minimal sugar, relatively speaking, then the butter to bind things together, and then the flour. That's kind of the logic behind the recipe. So we're just going to do one six worth, 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 worth of butter. If you're familiar with um, cookies, you know that often you'll use one and a half to two six of butter in a traditional cookie recipe. So this will be about half of a normal batch. We'll make 12, 15 cookies or so. Like that. We're going to go ahead and put that in the mixer. And uh, get the cable all untangled there. Now my mixture is loud, for those of you not familiar. Just be ready for that. And again, this is barely softened at all, this butter, but that will help. And I'm just looking to incorporate the butter and the sugar. I might as well add some salt now. I'm just doing that kind of by look. A little more than that. You want, you know, some salt in there. You don't want tablespoons of salt, but you want to give it enough to kind of punch things up. And I'm actually going to scrape that down. One of the downsides of using, um, of making smaller recipes, um, or s smaller batches, is that your ingredients can often just clump up onto your um, your your mixing uh, 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 blade uh, and not actually mix. So you may need to like scrape that down or even speed up your mixer to so make sure you don't have like some stuff on the sides and then this little core of like butter on the uh, uh, on the mixer that isn't actually getting mixed in into anything. As you can see, I have a big old clump of butter right there that isn't really getting mixed in. I mean, there's some mixing there, but I just need to do a little bit more scraping around. And unfortunately, there's, like, there's no way of designing a mixer or mixer bowl such that it is perfect for you know all ingredients of all sizes. In all circumstances. Okay, so we got that. I'm actually going to add a little vanilla. You do whatever you want in here in terms of flavoring. I'm just going to add like a dash of vanilla here. And again, you can eyeball this based on. Um, you know, you've probably made cookies before. You've probably seen people make cookies before, so you have some idea of uh, how much you would need. So I wouldn't get too crazy here in terms of measuring out exactly. And here's where if you were making softer cookies, you'd add eggs, for example. That would soften out the dough. Okay. So I know it's not mixed in completely, but once we add the flour in here, that should take care of that. All right, so we had two ounces of sugar, four ounces of butter, which means we want six ounces of flour. Two point three, oh, 6.25, I went a little bit over. One nice thing about being this precise is that you can live with a little bit more ambiguity tolerance. You know, you can, you can, you can get 
a, a little little off, and the difference will be so minuscule, you won't really notice it. Good, 6.0 exactly. Okay. This is going to make a very dense dough. Let's do a curry. Ah, yes, I do absolutely plan to do more, um, to have some more curry today. Just gonna have a tough time mixing these because, again, you have all of this stuff stuck to the sides and stuck to the beer, um, and it's not going to stick to the flour, the flour is not going to stick to it very well. So you got to scrape this down. To help that incorporate. And of course you could mix this by hand if you wanted to. But I do find the, the bowl mixer just does make things fat. Again, my ovens are already preheated. So it's getting crumbly now. You can see that's nice and crumbly. We're actually probably pretty close to our dough. And I could possibly scrape this down once more. Or I could do this by hand. One more scrapey, scrapey, scrapey. Yeah, that's gonna come together. Should come together pretty quickly. Feel that. Smells good too. Smells nice and vanilla y, sugary. Orange flavoring in this is very nice. Coffee flavoring, very nice. Not quite coming together. I might just do that manually. Let me actually slow this down a bit. comes together pretty easily. But it's just fighting me today. Could be the weather. It's very wet. I'm pretty sure these are the right uh, uh, this is the right ratio. starting to come together. Okay, yeah, these are gonna come way down. Fair enough. I could actually, yeah, there it comes. Um, I could actually add a little bit of butter just to soften this up a little bit. 
Yeah, nice. Should I do that? Actually, what I might do... So I don't really want to crack open another stick of butter. I'm going to add a little shortening. Um, and I will need to clean off one of these spoons to do that. Just had flour on there, so I'm not too worried about that, but I just don't want to put flour in my shortening. I'm just going to add some, ooh. Um, I'm going to add that much shortening. No idea how much that is. I could, I could measure it, but... Let's see what that does. See it starting to clump together better? Yeah, nice. Shortening is a little fat, and like butter, it helps things to clump together better. And it gives it a different mouth feel. And obviously there are also um, health benefits, pluses and minuses, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, that will just give us that. So let me go ahead. So now you can see what I have is a much more, uh, much something much more like a dough that you'd expect to find, you know, from a, a sugar cookie recipe or a, something, something along those lines. It's much, so fairly soft. So that's good. So now um, I'm going to move these over there just to here. Put some of my ingredients away this out of the way, and we can go ahead and put these out. Now, I am personally, oh, I should not have put that back. I am personally okay, a fan of being exact. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a little bit of wax paper, put that on my, my scale, and I'm going to dump all of my dough onto the scale and see exactly how much dough I have. I have 12.1 ounces, 12.05 ounces of dough. So I'm going to make one ounce cookies. Grab some parchment paper. Put that on my baking sheet so the cookies don't stick to it this back in here, and I'm going to start peeling off one ounce pieces. There we go. And I'm just going to squeeze those in my hand, I'm going to roll them out, roll them out in my hands, and put them down on my, uh, on there. I could roll this out potentially and do shapes, right? I think this would be a, a pretty decent dough for that. I think for now. I don't think I have any um, anime-themed cookie cutters. I should fix that. I should resolve that. And this is, again, one of the things I like about using the, uh, the scale is that I would not expect certain lump sizes to be the same in terms of cookies. But as it turns out, they are. So with the scale, you can know, okay, each one of these is exactly one ounce, or again, 1.05, 0.95, etc. Um, and so they're going to cook very evenly. You'll still have to be aware of the fact that your oven is uh, not necessarily uh, evenly heated all the way through. So it may be hotter in one part of the oven than another. Right? You can't, you can't, uh, fix that too easily, um, unless you actually fix the oven. But, and these will not spread much, because again, this is more of a sugar cookie dough, more of a shortbread dough. Um, they'll spread a little bit, but, but barely. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Almost there. Also, I would not mind melon pond. That's a good idea. 
Um, okay, we'll do that. We will do this. So we're nearly there. Um, I wonder if there's some. Uh, I I'm betting you can get like anime characters you could stamp on top of cookies. That'd be cool. So just do rounds and then stamp out, you know, uh, names or faces rather. That would be pretty awesome. All right, Whoa, way too much. 1.45, 1.2. Again, I would not have guessed that. Okay. And yeah, they're a little uneven. They they have a little. Uh, marks from my fingers, but I kind of like that. I like that they, they look a little different. 1.1, 1. 1. 1. 1. Will they all fit? So yeah, they shouldn't spread much at all, fortunately, so I can get them pretty close to each other on the, uh, on the sheet. They should all fit on this sheet. Unless I miss my guess, which I may have. Okay. I think I have uh, two more. Five. Point nine five. Point nine five. All right, fine. Add a little bit more from the sides. A little bit. Bigger. Stuck up there. Uh, yeah, we should be able to get all these on here. Again, we've got a nice vanilla smell. And that last one is 1.0. 1 1.0, exactly. Look at that. Life is good. Life is good. All right, put that on there. And these go in the oven. They're all pretty, pretty even. Let me wash my hands, and actually I'll take the opportunity to wash um, some of these things as well before I put them in the oven. Just because I've, you know, I've had cookie dough on my hands for the past couple of minutes, I kind of like to get that cleaned off before I work with any other stuff, and since I'm uh, uh, right here at the sink, it's a good opportunity to uh, to do that. Doing the full Alton Brown hand washing system. There we are. Hands are now clean. I gotta make sure I don't splash the uh, the cookies over there. Normally the cookies are on the other side of the kitchen, so there's uh, less chance of contamination. So I'll just let the the bowl fill up with hot water here for a few moments while I clean these off. The spoons, and normally I would. Uh, save this until after I put the cookies in the oven, but I'm here, my hands are clean, I'm at the sink, might as well get this done. And those will only take maybe 10 minutes to bake, 10, 15, you know, they're fairly small. And we'll bake them until they are just starting to brown on the edges. These brown pretty quickly. Um, if you leave them in there. So you just want to wait until they when I say they brown pretty quickly, I mean once they start to brown, if you leave them in there for much longer, they will um, start to brown and then blacken, you know, relatively quickly because they're so dense. So you want to wait until they're just starting to get brown on the uh, on the edges and then pull them out, and there'll still be some leftover baking, leftover heat in there that will finish off the bake when they come out. All right. And then over here for now. Just rinse off the hands. I got a little bit of, uh, I got some shortening on my hands here, so I'm just gonna use soap to rinse that off, or just to clean that off. 
Again, my hands are not unclean in the sense that there's germs on them. I'm just trying to get that, that shortening off my, cleaned off of my hands. All right. So I don't have to wash them the way I would wash, you know, hands to de-germify them. All right, in they, these go at 350. And I'm just going to set the timer for 10 minutes, just so I don't forget. Here you go. I can also take this opportunity to clean off. You can see the uh, <laughs> my trusty stand mixer has gotten some flour on it over time as. As I mix flour in here, inevitably some of that flour puffs up, poofs out, as my mom would say it, and uh, gets onto the mixer. So I like to wipe that down. Just makes it look nicer. And inevitably you find, oh, a little something that got up in there, a little like piece of bit of dough or something. And so we can just kind of clean that off from like a, a previous Previous recipe or something. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice thing. And so if you want soft cookies, like a chocolate chip, chocolate chip cookie, um, you want equal parts, roughly equal parts, butter, sugar, and f uh, flour. And you'll add an egg or two, depending on the size of your batch, obviously. Um, so the egg will again help them to soften out. Swapping out the white sugar for brown sugar will make them softer as well. Um, and then with that, you can add your chocolate chips and you have chocolate chip cookies, which I might make later on today. Who knows? Maybe on Sunday. Maybe as the as we wind down the uh, um, you know after closing ceremonies, whatever the heck that's going to be. I still have no idea how I'm going to do closing ceremony. Um, <laughs> I think that'd be a good idea for closing ceremonies. Make some cookies. Okay. I also I haven't had lunch yet. I think I'm not very hungry, so I might wait until the panel starts and just come in here and again like zap some curry or something. Um, so I'll still listen in on the on the panel, obviously, but um, I may run in here just long enough to to get my lunch. dry this out, and I do like cleaning and drying these off immediately, because then you get all of your stuff is nice and, you know, everything's good. Everything looks nice and shiny and new. Shiny and new. And then that can go in. Okay, so I want to put that in. Ooh, that's going to be difficult, because I want to put that in as well. I have my dough hook here all the times I make bread. Um, so perhaps I need like a lid or something for that instead of upside down. Not sure. And now we can put the, the scale away. I need to clean off a little bit. What is that? Oh, just some little soap got onto the scale. Soapy scale sounds like a Comedian from the 30s, I don't know. So yeah, panels will be starting at 1 p.m. for about half an hour. In the meantime, we can uh, just talk general stuff. As I'm sure folks are getting their own lunches right now, I'm not paying too close attention to, to this stream. Um, and it's also a good opportunity to take this and put it back. Same thing here. All right. This is something I've, I've come to believe in, that if you clean up as you go, then you basically don't have any cleanup to do. Uh, or more accurately, the cleanup is done by the time you're done with the, with the whole baking process. So instead of, instead of trying to spend the next five minutes, you know, catching up on TikTok or whatever, I just do my cleaning and then you know, I can do TikTok a little later. 
whatever is the time waster. But now, we're good to go. Yeah. Also, I had a big breakfast, so I guess that also explains that. Matt, you find washing dishes therapeutic? I hear that too. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. I find washing dishes often therapeutic. Oh, interesting. I did not realize. Ah, no. There we go. Um, is that on over here as well? It is. For some reason, YouTube chat was disabled. There we are. Now you can actually see the chat. Look at that. That's nice. So yeah, I find washing dishes therapeutic as well. Um, to an extent. <laughs> There's certainly a point at which... Um, come on. There we go. There's certainly a point at which washing dishes just gets kind of... And that's enough. Alexa, check notifications. One new notification. Sorry. From Amazon Shopping. A shipment will arrive today, including skincare products. Should have muted that. What skincare products are coming? Um, what skincare product did I order? Hmm. Could be something for the workshop, like gloves or something. The Zen of dishwashing liquid. Yeah. Zen and the art of washing dishes. There's probably a book with that name. So uh, we've been going about six minutes on the the cookies. I know that's certainly not enough time, so I'm not going to open the oven. Um, you want to open the oven, um, or you want to limit the amount of times you open the oven when you're baking something, um, simply because opening the oven door uh, will lower the temperature of the oven a bit, right? Because you're now getting uh, air that's not 350 degrees coming into the oven. But also I find that you know, people get really, really obsessed with that. And they're like, you know, don't open the oven door ever. There are one or two recipes where you, don't, where you want to be very careful about that. But in general, if you're baking cookies, you can open the door a few times. It's not going to not gonna kill anything. So, um, you know, don't beat yourself up too much if you're checking your cookies occasionally. Um, just don't open the door every 30 seconds, right? Or even every, every 10 seconds is more of the, uh, the problem. Cool. I'm just going to wait for these to, to bake, and then we're, we're good to go. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of ratios in cookies, cooking. There is indeed a book called Ratio, which is all about the, um, the, the various ratios you can use to make bread and cookies and, and various treats and various just food. And I highly recommend that if you're looking for a, a procedure for cooking as opposed to a recipe. Um, um, procedure is sort of more like a schematic, more like a, a structure for it, as opposed to here are all the things you do, more here are the pieces you need and the ratios you want, and then you can, you can riff from that point. You can add and subtract and, and put in your own flavorings or whatever, but you, you know how to make um, you know, uh, a type of thing as opposed to just an, a specific thing. You know, it's a very uh, useful and uh, empowering skill to have in general. It's the same thing with woodworking. You know, um, uh, I wouldn't tell people um, here are the here is the exact way to make this one thing. I prefer to tell people here's how I made this one thing in the broadest sense. And then if you want to make it a little taller, a little sh shorter, you know, whatever, you can, you can adjust to that point. We're telling people, you know, cut this board 38 and 3 quarters inches. I, I don't know that that is, that that is helping people um, too much. It can be helpful, but um, um, as a general rule for how everyone should be doing things, you should learn how to do things in general. You should learn the, the practice of doing things um, and then use the specifics as inspiration and as uh, as detailed guides when you need them, but not following those specific steps every single time. Um, right, exactly. You know, knowing that okay, I can as long as I adjust these three things in this one way, I can add and subtract things. Cookies are a great example where if, you know if you have a basic um, like chocolate chip cookie dough style recipe, you can add nuts to that. You can have fewer chocolate chips, more chocolate chips. 
Uh, you can swap things around. There will be a point at which you kind of overfill the dough with other things, and there's not enough dough to hold it all together, obviously. But you can, you know, you can, you can really fiddle around with that to a great degree. Um, you know. All right. So we're almost done with that timer. Let me just check the cookies. They are still pale white, quite. So I'm gonna add um, probably I'm gonna add two more minutes onto the timer and see where that gets us. Unfortunately, my oven is it's hard to look in through the oven window even with the light on uh, because there's that you know they have that weird like little grill stuff in there. So I can't really see the cookies very well. I can tell that there are cookies in there, but I can't really tell like are they browning really? I just it's not very helpful. Um, it, it's helpful to be able to see, okay, <laughs> the soup is boiling over and it's spilling everywhere. You can, you can tell macro level, but not really details of what's in there. Um, which I guess is kind of, is fine, right? I guess that's the idea, is it's just there to show you the, the basics. Oh, well. Ooh, it's got a power flicker. That's always fun. I would not be surprised if the stream dies at some point today. Um, just because it's the weekend, you know, everybody's using the internet, um, especially during this you know, COVID-19 lockdown, uh, everyone's at home streaming Netflix, um, and so if, if I lose internet at some point, that will not surprise me at all. Um, fortunately, I think YouTube will allow me to reconnect to the stream um, uh, if I get knocked down, so it won't kill the stream entirely, but don't be shocked. Another two minutes. You'll notice I'm wearing uh, short sleeves today. It's actually a very nice day out. I think I should probably uh, turn on the, the fan. Um, that might be a thick. One second. I'm feeling kind of warm in here. Yeah, sure enough. Uh, with the oven on. Oops, sorry. Ah, and with it being a uh, warm day outside. Uh, the temperature inside here is getting warmer and warmer. And whenever I, I bake, I find I benefit from having looser clothes. Um, nope, not yet. Another two minutes, at least. On fun neighborhood walking challenge. I like it. Um, if I could switch over the uh, the live stream to my my phone, I take it outside and we walk around. It's um. It's a rainy day today, although it's not raining right now, so we could certainly do that and not worry about getting, uh, getting poured on. DDR challenge, yeah. Oh, I did buy Animal Crossing, by the way, uh, the other day, so we could do a, like, a little Animal Crossing thing at some point. Um, I need to switch back on my Nintendo Online account and figure out how to do all of that. I never, you know, this is my first time playing any Animal Crossing. Um, but that'd be fun. So maybe, in fact, let me see if I've got that um, well, no, I, I know I have it working, because I fired it up and just went through the, the basics. So I have a tent. That's about it. That's literally it. <laughs> um, it's as far as I got la uh, last night. Um, I have played DDR before, though. Uh, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, what did I play that on? PS2? So I think I had a, a DDR mat that I played on for a little bit. Or it could have been like a DDR knockoff, you know, one of those, um, you know. Dance, dance, recharge <laughs> kind of games. It's not DDR at all. Um, cool, good hit, uh, Becca. Yeah, well, I'll, uh, teach me senpai, Animal Crossing. Um, Oh, totally, yeah. People who are good at DDR are just insane. Um, there's a, uh, a DDR-like game with, it has, I think it's eight different buttons you have to press. Um, so you do these little bubbles that you, you press on, on this pad. So you're, it's like playing the piano. And good players at that, you know, like the hardest level of detail on that, you are pressing basically all the buttons the entire time. It is just for the entire song, and it's just, how do you do that? And I, I, you, know, you see the streams of folks who get it perfect on those things, and it's just, oh my gosh, you're spending hours and hours on that game. It's crazy. 
Um, set Mania. Cool, I've heard of that. Sort of a, uh, you know, PC Mac Linux uh, variation on DDR. Okay, I'm seeing a little bit of browning, just slightly. So I'm going to leave those in there for, for another maybe 30 seconds. Like, they're starting to change color on the edges, but I wouldn't call it brown yet. I call it more like a, a tan. Let me grab a uh, some cooling racks here. That one. Put those over here. Mm. Yeah, it, it is astonishing seeing folks play some of these rhythm games where they are just, you know, again, they, they are spending hours every day practicing those things. And that's crazy. Even like uh, Beat Saber, you know, folks are, who are just good at that and just nuts. Really cool to see those skills. Cookies. Having a thought. Yes. I'm going to do something. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Look at that. That makes me pretty happy. Whoops. Wrong way. this down a little bit? No, a little bit. So there are cookies. And I'm going to try something. No idea if this is going to work or how it's going to work or in what way it might work. I have a bunch of these uh, Hershey's hugs and kisses. So let's just throw some on here. I have a weird feeling that they're just going to fall off. <laughs> I'm trying to push them in a little bit, which is what I normally do for uh, peanut blossoms. Right, we have the, uh, the peanut butter cookies. And those are softer. So again, this might not work. It might just fall all over the place. And I should have had all these ready to go. Because these are cooling as we speak, and they're not really, they feel like they're not sticking very well. But, you know, just throwing something else on, just for fun. I don't think it's going to make them bad. <laughs> yeah, right? like, I'm not going to turn up my nose at these and say, oh, ugh. I won't eat any of these because they have uh, the, the chocolate fell off. How, how dare you? Put a few more on here. And I will try not to do this thing I did last time and show you the cookies and have them all fall down. That was epic. One more. Come on. Come on. And I'll show you the whole, the whole set. Rather nice, if I do so myself. And again, that was one part sugar, two parts butter, three parts flour. Oven is off. It's all good to go. <laughs> um, so the problem is if you wait until they cool, then the chocolate um, just sits on top. Um, it might melt a little bit, but it doesn't really stick. If you um, wait, uh, or if, if you do them immediately, 
the cookie is still a little soft and tender, and so you can push into it gently and sort of seat the chocolate on there. And the chocolate will melt a little bit, but then it will re-solidify, it'll kind of bind the cookie a little bit better. So it's a little better to have a, um, actually put them in immediately, as opposed to waiting until the cookie's cool, as it turns out. All right. So there's that. And I will look into seeing if I can find like an anime face, or like an anime eye or something, like a stamp that I could stamp into cookies. That'd be really fun. Um, yeah, and I only know that because I made peanut, peanut blossoms before, which are the, again, peanut butter cookies with a Hershey's Kiss in the middle. Um, and I made the mistake of waiting and putting it in there, the, 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 the kiss just falls off, off immediately. Uh, but if I did it immediately, then the, uh, you know, put it in immediately and push it in a little bit, it's stuck. So, just the things you learn from doing it for a while. Um, cool, all right, um, I need to transition back into the other room and get set up for the panel. So, hope you found that useful, and uh, please stand by.